Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar event here at the Harriman Institute. Uh, my name is Alex Cooley. I'm the current director of the Harriman Institute. I'm also a professor of political science at Barnard College. It is an absolute pleasure and a thrill um, to bring you today's event, which is on the release of this uh, really uh, important new Freedom House report out of sight, not out of reach, the global scale and scope of transnational uh, repression. And we have uh, co-authors of the report here, uh, Nate Schenken and Isabel Linzer. We'll post their full bios here, but let me just mention that uh, Nate is Director for Research and Strategy at Freedom House, and he previously served as Director for uh, Special Research at Freedom House, and also as the Project Director for Nations in Transit. Um, he has experience researching Eurasia and Turkey, uh, and also um, uh, one of our, we like to claim him as one of our own too, as, as a Harriman uh, Very fair. Uh, Very alum. fair. And then also to welcome uh, Isabel Linzer, who's a research analyst for technology and democracy at Freedom House and leads Election Watch for Digital Age, where she tracks the interplay of elections, internet platforms, human rights around the world. And she has regional expertise in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So. Uh, these are, um, you know, the scope of this report is really, um, you know, quite breathtaking. I think those of us in Eurasia um, who have looked at this issue are somewhat familiar with some of the higher profile cases, and we know about um, sort of, you know, um, Uzbek communities abroad, Tajik communities abroad, what's been going on in Kazakhstan, and then, of course, you know, the issues, some of the issues surrounding Russia that have been uh, magnified by recent events, but I think that the, the sheer um, um, scale of what you describe in this report, because what your document is just since sort of 2014, um, is absolutely you know, fascinating and frankly terrifying. So uh, thank you for um, you know being with us today for sharing this important research. And the format is uh, Isabel and Nate will present the findings in the report. Uh, we will also put the report on a link. Um, so that you can see it in the chat, um, along with their uh, with, along with their bios, and then we will open it up to Q and A. So if you have questions, um, please use uh, the Q and A function in the Zoom. If you are on YouTube, type your question, and it will be relayed to us, and we'll try and get to as many of the questions as we can um, in our time. So without further ado, um, take us through this um, really remarkable piece of research. Thanks, and bear with me for one moment while I get the screen sharing uh, set up correctly um, so that you all can see. Okay, can everybody see the slide and the presentation? Looking good? Okay, um, yeah, well, thank you. Greetings and thank you to so many people. It's so exciting to see such a big crowd. Um, we're really excited to share our work on this topic. Uh, as Alex said, I'm Nate Schenken and I'm joined by my colleague, Isabel, who is a, a research analyst at Freedom House and the co-author of the report. Um, and before we start, I also really want to thank Alex for hosting us. Um, and it's extremely fitting that we get to share this report with the Harriman Institute at the Harriman Institute, because the idea for this report actually came from a workshop on transnational repression that the Harriman Institute hosted, that Ed Lemon, uh, who may or may not be in the participants, but that Ed Lemon organized uh, in May 2018. And it was at that workshop that um, for me and for Freedom House, I think a lot of connections were made uh, between study work we were already doing, work that was already out there. Um, by people like Ed Lemon, John Heather Shaw, Sipira Furstenberg, also Dana Moss, Fiona Adamson, among the people who were there. Um, and that was a really important event for us, and I think a real testament to Harriman's role in kind of generating new ideas. So in a, in a certain sense, I think getting to present it here brings the project full circle. And so it's really great to be able to do it this way. Um, now let me get into the findings. Um, this is, we believe, the first global study of transnational repression, meaning attacks on exiles and diasporas by the governments of the countries they've left. Um, there have certainly been very good case studies on specific countries or regions, especially on Central Asia, the Central Asia Political Exiles Database being a key inspiration for this project. Um, on certain incidents, on certain tactics, um, such as the work by Marcus Michelson on digital intimidation, um, digital tools. We believe this is the first time that a human rights organization has tried to look at the full global scale and scope, and that was really our objective. Um, so to conduct the study, we compiled and examined 608 cases of direct physical transnational repression since 2014. And so 
in that definition, what we included are assassinations or assassination attempts, um, renditions or abductions, however you want to call them, um, assaults, unlawful deportations, and detentions. And we compiled and coded these cases so that we could try to understand who's doing what to whom, where, how. Um, what we found is that there are dozens of countries engaged in physical transnational repression. In our count, 31 origin states who are targeting exiles and 79 host states. And uh, between those uh, origin states and host states, you have 160 unique pairings. Um, so truly a global phenomenon. You'll see a map at the end of the presentation and you can see these lines going back and forth. Um, in addition to this very large group of physical direct incidents, we took into account and we tried to explain other forms of transnational repression that are not included in that count. Um, so this includes things like coercion by proxy, imprisoning family members and loved ones, digital intimidation, spyware, um, mobility controls like passport cancellations. And these are very widespread tactics. Um, very difficult to quantify because they are so widespread. They're, they're practically every day, as some of us have taken to calling them. Um, but they're very serious in their effects. And so we thought it was very important to include them in the report and to, to try to give a typology of how they're used. Um, now, considering the impact that these physical attacks have on a large community. Um, so when a physical attack takes place, an assassination or rendition, the way the fear and trauma of that ripples out, um, considering that, considering the prevalence of everyday tactics and the way that they affect communities, we estimate at least three and a half million people globally to be facing transnational repression. Uh, and then in addition in the report, um, for those who have a time to read it, we profiled six case studies, six bad offender uh, origin states, um, China, Rwanda, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. And we really tried in each of those case studies, I think, to examine what is unique about each of these and how they differ and what's unusual um, in each case. Um, and then in addition, there's some regional summaries at the end where we try to cover you know, the remaining 25 countries, uh, not in the case studies. Um, let's see, next one. Um, this can all be very abstract. I think probably for the audience here, perhaps it's not as abstract as for others, but just to give a sense of what we're talking about. Um, some individuals that we wanna highlight as individual stories that so people understand what we mean when we say transnational repression. Um, Jamal Khashoggi is the, is the most famous. Um, Everyone knows, I think, that story from October 2018 when a, journal, a journalist, Washington Post contributing columnist, murdered by the Saudi uh, government, by Saudi officials who had come to Turkey to murder him uh, in the Saudi consulate. Um, Lujain al Hathloul is a Saudi activist currently imprisoned. She was sentenced in December for national security crimes uh, for her activism. Um, she was, in fact, kidnapped um, from the United Arab Emirates uh, before being put on trial. Paul Rusesa Bagina. Uh, a Rwandan activist who had left Rwanda in the 1990s. He's in fact the hero, for the, everyone who's seen it, of the movie Hotel Rwanda. Um, Rusesa Bagana was kidnapped this August, so just a few months ago, um, when he was transiting through the United Arab Emirates. And then finally, of these four, Guimen Hai, um, a Chinese, uh, Chinese origin but Swedish citizen bookseller who was living in Thailand when he was kidnapped uh, and brought back to China, where he was put on trial and actually forced to renounce his Swedish citizenship. Uh, these are just four examples. There are hundreds in the report. Um, I think what really drives home for us as we're working on it is, is how many human stories there are and how many people are affected as you work on it. Um, but let's get into the meat of the, the analysis and the typology, and I'll let Isabel do that heavy lift. All right, thanks, Nate. Thanks for setting it up. So what we really tried to do with this report was explain the logic of transnational repression and especially why it's becoming such a global problem. And we identify three main reasons. First is the growth of digital tools. Second, securitized migration regimes. And finally, impunity. So starting with digital tools, exiles in diaspora have more influence from abroad than they've had at any point in history. And that's very clearly because of the nature of digital communications technology. But at the same time, regimes also have more tools for reaching exiles, and, and that's in the form of spyware, surveillance, and digital intimidation tools. So one way this could play out, uh, say there's an Iranian exiled activist in the UK, and they're flooded with harassment and threats via social media, and that's directed by the Iranian regime, and eventually it becomes not worth it for the person engaging in the activism. It's, it's too much, and they have to stop engaging um, in that type of that type of behavior. Uh, 
So second is migration regimes. And most cases of physical transnational repression involve one government, so the origin state, co-opting the government of the host country in order to reach the targeted individual. For example, this is a hypothetical, say someone from Tajikistan flees to Germany and they are arrested by German authorities and maybe even deported because the Tajikistani government has accused them of terrorism. So what we're seeing then is how as migration regimes become increasingly focused on national security, including in democracies, there are more and more opportunities for authoritarian states to then have people detained, deported, or abducted in those countries. And finally, impunity is making the problem worse. There is really a striking lack of accountability for flagrant acts of transnational repression like assassinations and abductions. And that lack of accountability means that without consequences, these governments continue to pursue their critics abroad undeterred. I think President Paul Kagame's regime is a great example of that. So the Rwandan regime has assassinated opponents abroad since the 1990s, and here we are more than two decades later, and they are still carrying out that brazen campaign of transnational repression. Next slide. So shifting gears a little bit to dig in more and understand how transnational repression actually takes place, we divided methods of transnational repression into four categories. So first is direct attacks. This covers physical attacks on individuals that happen directly without any intermediary. So this includes assassinations, assaults, and some renditions. And this is when or, uh, operatives of the origin state physically reach the targeted individual in the host country. Next is co-opting other countries. And here the origin state co-opts another state's institutions to act for them. Often this happens through spurious judicial or law enforcement proceedings, and we see it play out in detentions, deportations, and many renditions. So think back to that example of a Tajikistani exile I shared a moment ago. When they're detained in Germany on terrorism charges, German law enforcement institutions are actually being co-opted to help Tajikistan's government engage in transnational repression. And I'll also flag here that Interpol abuse is a form of co-option because it effectively tricks another country into acting on behalf of the origin state. The third category of transnational repression is mobility controls. And this is where origin states actually control individuals' ability to move internationally, including through passport cancellations, the denial of consular services, and reporting passports as lost or stolen. It's a very direct way that origin states can interfere and control the day-to-day -day lives and rights of people who've left the country. And finally, there are threats from a distance. And this includes some of the most widespread or everyday forms of transnational repression, especially coercion by proxy, in which family members are threatened or uh, harassed in order to pressure that targeted individual. Threats from a distance also includes digital tools like smear campaigns, threats and harassment on social media, and spyware. So methods are often used in combination and to amplify each other. So a passport cancellation becomes a method to trap an individual in one place, and while they're stuck in that known location, a rendition then occurs. Or sometimes family members are imprisoned as a way to place pressure on an individual, and digital tools are used to smear them or communicate those threats. And I'm seeing it looks like we might have lost the PowerPoint. Oh, it might be back. Uh, okay, we're holding. Um, uh, but I can go ahead and start talking about um, the tactics a little bit more. So digging into those four categories, we divided them then into different tactics. And so I just wanna take a moment to dig a little deeper to understand what the 31 origin states are doing. Um, a couple highlights. Uh, First is that the most common tactics we observed are renditions and coercion by proxy. Each of them are used in 26 and 25 states respectively. Also of note is that 17 states are using spyware extraterritorially against exiles and diaspora. And we just note here that we took a very narrow definition of this question. So it's also very possible that there are many more cases not included in our approach. And finally, China, as you'll see on this graphic here, is the only country that uses every tactic we listed. And following that, in case it's a little bit too small to read, is Uzbekistan, then Rwanda, Russia, Tajikistan, Iran, and Turkey. And with that, I'll hand it back to Nate. Great. Thanks. Sorry, everyone, for the technical 
snafu um but we seem to be back so yes let's talk about who's targeted um and and who the who the targets are um as I said at the top, we estimated made this estimate of three and a half million people. This is a very rough, and in fact, I think quite conservative estimate um, globally of the, the populations affected. Um, and what we did to do that was basically divide up who the targets are for these 31 different origin states and make estimates on those populations. And in some cases, those targets are a very small fraction actually of the populations in diaspora of those states because the people who are targeted are, are in fact only people from certain populations, um, certain um, ethnic groups or religious groups in some cases or people associated with a narrow slice of political opposition. Um, but in other cases, like the case of Rwanda that Isabel was talking about, the persecution is actually total. Um, essentially, every member of the Rwanda diaspora faces a threat um, simply for being in diaspora and for being perceived as uh, potentially disloyal um, to the regime. Um, so now to go into some of the, the, the findings about um, who these people are um, and, and what the charges are that people face. Uh, one of the most striking things we found was that terrorism accusations are used in a majority of cases. We've talked about the co-optation um, component of this uh, problem. Um, this is a, a key part of it. Um, all over the world, states use terrorism now as a cudgel to suspend rights and to go after their opponents abroad. Um, so 58% of the cases we compiled involve terrorism accusations. And this also included 90 renditions and nine assassinations or assassination attempts from 10 different origin states. Um, I'll also note that some of the governments that do this are very explicit about um, their justification. I don't want to say their, um, their reason, but their justification for being able to do it, which is the US war on terror, or in some cases, Israel's uh, targeted killings programs. Um, an example that I often cite is that the Turkish uh, pro-government, essentially state media newspaper, Daily Sabah, um, has a section of the paper called the war on terror. And this section of the paper features stories about kidnappings of people from abroad um, that are being explicitly compared to what the US did in the war on terror. Um, and connected with this finding, uh, people of Muslim origin are far and away the dominant targets of physical transnational repression in our study. So 78% of the cases we compiled uh, appear to be victims of Muslim origin. And we're not making a determination about anyone's piety or religious practice, but simply their origin. Um, and this is due to a confluence of several reasons. Um, first, Anti-terrorism narrative, of course, is very much bound up with um, perceptions of um, Islamic politics and what Muslims do when they engage politically um, and connects with the strict national security turn in migration that's taken place in democracies as well over the last 20 years. Um, the second is that, of course, some of the most important origin states that are severely repressive are mostly Muslim. So Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Central Asian states, when they go after their nationals abroad, they're mostly going after Muslims because most of their nationals are Muslims. The third, though, is that many of the most prolific abusers uh, specifically target Muslim minorities. Um, so these are not Muslim majority states, but they're targeting specifically Muslim minorities like Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims uh, from China um, or Chechens and other North Caucasians uh, from Russia. Um, in terms of specific countries, I know Isabel's talked a little bit about Rwanda. I just wanna highlight a couple of other things and we can talk at length, I think, about other countries as we go forward. But a couple points to make is that China really does stand out in the study um, for running the most sophisticated, global, comprehensive campaign of transnational repression in the world. It has the largest number of cases in the compilation. Um, a big part of this, of course, is this vast campaign against Uyghurs um, that spills all over the world, um, but it also includes many other targets um, emanating from China. So other Turkic Muslims, Tibetans, Falun Gong practitioners, human rights defenders, former Chinese Communist Party insiders um, in this big anti-corruption drive known as Fox Hunt, and recently Hong Kongers, which has happened only in the last year, mostly. Um, a second country to highlight is Turkey, um, which, really has this incredible explosion in renditions and in use of rendition as a state tactic, very official, very overt use of renditions, kidnappings uh, since 2016. So obviously, as, as I hope everyone knows, Turkey had a coup attempt in July 2016 and the government's turn in that was to accuse the Gulen movement of organizing it. And then 
really launched into this huge campaign that's extended and continues to this day over the last five years um, to bring people home through what the UN Special Rapporteurs have called a systematic practice of state-sponsored extraterritorial abductions and forced returns. Um, and I think that's an important one to stress because Turkey is so central in a lot of these discussions about future norms, about the shifts in norms in the world um, as a kind of swing state or bridge state between, you know, uh, more autocratic or democratic powers um, it, within NATO in relations with the EU. And because Turkey has really felt very comfortable in doing this over the last five years and has essentially not faced any consequences for this part of their policies. Um, now, I'll wrap up with very brief recommendations. I know this isn't necessarily a policy, you know, oriented uh, crowd maybe, but we wanna talk about what you can do so it doesn't just come down to, you know, terrible stories about terrible things. Um, you know, there's a lot that democracies can do to address this problem. Um, there can be, there's, there's, and we would divide it into two main areas, accountability and resilience. Accountability includes of course, the flip side of impunity, which is applying sanctions and really going after perpetrators who are responsible for these things, um, especially the most flagrant and overt attacks. Um, and doing that consistently, doing that when the perpetrator is not Iran, though doing it when it is Iran as well, but doing it when the perpetrator is Saudi Arabia, doing it when the perpetrator is Turkey, um, and making it clear that these are not acceptable actions uh, in, in, in the international community. Um, the second way uh, to have greater accountability is actually to examine whether our own laws uh, domestically within, our, within, within democracies are effective in dealing with this kind of problem. There's a lot of issues obviously over the past six, seven years around foreign agents, around the issue of how do you combat foreign influence. And I think there's a strong sense that uh, US laws in particular are not particularly up to date um, for addressing these problems. And one of the questions is, how do you address it when the issue is really espionage against an individual who's vulnerable? What is called in some European contexts refugee espionage and is actually explicitly criminalized. So we think we need to look at that in the US context as well. Um, the second area to talk about is resilience. Um, and this is about how we strengthen our own systems to make it so it's harder to be co-opted. Um, so there's less, less easy to be exploited. Um, the first is uh, really to address the problems in our migration system. Um, the very hyper aggressive enforcement, the real prejudice and disposition towards detention and deportation makes it much easier for people to be targeted uh, through these means. So we need to uh, roll back some of the hyper aggressive measures in the US of the last four years in Europe of the last six or seven. Um, and we need to rebuild our asylum system so that we can allow people to seek asylum in our countries so people can do that safely and securely and they don't get bottled up uh, in particular in these third countries like Thailand or Turkey where people are very vulnerable um, and where they do not have the protections that they would have if they were able to properly seek asylum uh, in, a, in a democracy. Um, that is uh, what we have in the presentation. So there's so much more we can talk about um, and we're looking forward to your questions. Super, thanks so much. So uh, let me kick off with um, just a couple of uh, uh, questions to you both. Uh, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's taken a lot of um, uh, uh, time to sort of carve out, I think what is so distinctive about this, this space. And, and, and I think the report does a really great job of, of showing this really is a distinct phenomenon. And one of the, um, points that you make is that, you know, it does, it's not just a, a host state and ascending state that you need, you know, the, the kind of the infrastructure that allows for these activities to take place. Like, yes, some targeted assassinations probably happen without the host state being aware, but there are a range of behaviors in which there really is coordination, collusion, um, a concerted effort to tap into the domestic legal system, regulatory system, um, as well as sort of security services. So maybe could, could you say a little bit something about this, the kind of diplomacy, formal and informal, that facilitates some and has been facilitating some of this transnational uh, repression. You've talked about sort of the enabling circumstances of 
kind of restrictive migration laws and asylum laws, but well, what goes on behind the scenes? What are some of the behaviors that have allowed some of this to take place and flourish? Right. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And uh, obviously there's some challenge here in that a lot of what takes place is necessarily covert. This is where you're getting into more reading between the lines uh, and, and, and what's suggested rather than what you can actually document. Um, so two things I would say. One is that there's a lot, there, there's pretty strong patterns of financial and diplomatic pressure associated with um, certainly things like Turkey's extensive rendition campaign or China's efforts to have Uyghurs returned to the country. And you see this in well-documented cases. So you take the case of the kidnapping of the six teachers from Kosovo um, in 2018. Um, there's been a very good parliamentary report by the Kosovo parliament on this kidnapping. And it can never break down because of its scope as a report um, exactly who did what uh, from outside of Kosovo. Um, but you can really read between the lines and see that the intelligence agency in Kosovo had been co-opted by Turkey um, and had been suborned in order to serve the purposes of having those people um, rendered out of out of Kosovo and sent to Turkey. And then you get into the speculation of what was the exact mechanism of pressure. And there's been a lot of discussion in the press about this um, in the Balkans um, and in other media about, you know, Turkish investment, Turkish protection for uh, the former Kosovo president um, who's facing trial in The Hague, um, a number of different mechanisms of leverage that could have been used. But essentially, you do see a lot of very informal but pretty clear pressure coming in those ways. The second way, and one that Alex, I know you've written about, um, is regional cooperation institutions. Um, so there is this element of institutionalization taking place in certain areas, in Central Asia through the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and in the Middle East through the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, these are at different levels, I think, of institutionalization. The SCO is much more kind of robustly, at, at least in some sense, appears to be more robustly institutionalized. The GCC is remarkable because some of the agreements that pertain here are literally handwritten agreements between members of, a royal, of royal families. So they're literally signed by princes and kings, um, you know, on a piece of paper. Um, but we've seen, but, but, but there are copies of those that were leaked to journalists. And so we know they exist. We know that we know there are actual agreement, agreements here. Um, and so, yes, the co-optation, you know, in some sense, yes, sometimes it's people being manipulated, being used unawares. Sometimes it's willing, for sure. There are definitely cases here where we have people saying, uh, we're happy to hand this person over, or at least we don't mind handing this person over or allowing you to do this to this person. Right. Um, so I, my second question is actually going to jump on a question in the chat and just reconfigure it a bit, which was, um, making a comment about Ben Rhodes's new book when he outlines how U.S. behavior in the war on terror allowed other nations to use talking points to justify um, that we now uh, that we now uh, condemn. And I, I also thinking about the, the 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 U.S. case and this really good point you make about impunity. It was the expose of the U.S. rendition program um, that came out, and I think in about two thousand four um, that that. I, I would say, you know, put a halt to it in, in, in that kind of configuration, even though in the same space, we saw Russia and China doing similar things. And I'm wondering, you know, have you thought about that, both the U.S. role in sort of enabling this with the kind of anti-constitutionalism of the Patriot Act and the war on terror and these kinds of features, but also are there any lessons about how we were able to put a check on it or a hold on it here um, and what's been missing in these same kind of accountability efforts overseas? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we did think a lot about the war on terror in doing this. I mean, it was definitely on our minds a lot from the beginning of the project um, because of the timeline in which we, we felt comfortable um, basically feeling like we could get a really good grasp on the cases. We had to limit it. Um, in time. We just felt like we couldn't go back far enough in time. Um, I think it would be really interesting and important to do that, but just in terms of kind of our capacity, we weren't able to do it, to go back to the U.S., you know, the height of the war on terror. Um, I think in terms of potential lessons from it, obviously the, the, the top lesson is the eternal one for us, at least, or what we think is the eternal one, is that you expose these things, you talk about them, you make them visible, you stop making them things that are whispered about or are buried in, um, in some of these cases are buried in, I guess, I would say regional discussions, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything we're saying 
that is news to people about Rwanda that's news to people who work on Rwanda or that's news about Iran to people who work on Iran and, and on and on. And, and I wouldn't pretend that we've broken that story, but we want to make it so people realize this is going on all the time and is a global problem that, that everybody is dealing with and that we need to address globally and together. Um, so hopefully that's, I think, our, you know, our theory is that talking about it openly, making it clear this is a real thing that happens all the time is not um, kind of just something that pops up occasionally, but is actually quite systematic and quite regularized um, and becoming normalized is the thing that you do in order to push it back. Um, it's definitely gonna take more than that. Some of these countries don't have free press, don't have um, accountability mechanisms um, through which they'll be held accountable domestically in the same way that, that the US government was at that time. Um, but we think this is a very important and, and you know, inevitable step um, to getting to that accountability. Great. And I have a question here from uh, Peter Frankopan and uh, actually for you, Isabel, then maybe you can also add your, your thoughts to the previous question too. And, he asks about, um, are, you know, why are levels of oppression uh, and repression rising? Are new technologies to blame? Or are there other causes too? Maybe you can take us a little bit through, what is it about these new technologies that facilitate this kind of repression and surveillance? And, you know, wasn't technology supposed to be liberating um, in a certain sense? That is the question, right? Is technology liberating? I think, you know, a lot of it for this issue starts with how the origin states, how those governments view the people in exile and in the, in the diaspora. And in the case of transnational repression, it's that they are fundamentally a threat to the existing regime. So that means when someone has a YouTube channel based in Canada and they are speaking to people back in Iran, um, that's a threat in a way that their reach is just so much greater than it ever could have been before. Um, I think there's definitely some connections in the Saudi case, for example, of the realization of this around the Arab Spring um, and some other examples of that as well. And in, so that's kind of the side of how they, they become a threat, right? But then in on the flip side, we have this connected network that reveals a lot about the people in question who the regimes do see as a threat. So even beyond something like a specific spyware infection on a person's phone, there's this necessary online presence that's required and that can make people vulnerable. So if you're an activist and you are trying to engage online, right? You have your social media feeds and that provides a lot of information about who you are, where you are, who you talk to. And that puts not just you, but also the people you interact with at risk. And so this gets back to the idea Nate was saying earlier about kind of how these issues of transnational repression expand beyond the single person who's being targeted. So in that way, for example, a spyware infection, which of course is a newer technology, that has a much bigger impact because of the interconnected nature of how diaspora activism works at this point. So any weak point that is targeted, any single person, even if it's not the ultimate number one leader of the movement that you're trying to target, any point of weakness within a network that is established online um, can weaken and disrupt the entire community. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I see it, but I would like to say that it's not a set balance, right? So we have the tension between whether technology is good for diaspora and for political activism and whether it makes them too vulnerable and, and kind of which wins out. And we can do something to tip that balance, right? So governments, for example, can uh, restrict exports on surveillance technology. I think that's a huge point. That's a way we can advocate to shift that balance. And civil society can also um, help as well by providing digital hygiene trainings, not just to those most high profile journalists, but also to people in communities who might be targeted. Um, so it's, you know, it's an ever changing balance, I think, but it is really crucial to, to understanding how transnational repression kind of gets built up and can spill over and affect broader communities. Those are great points. And maybe if I ask you just for a short follow up, just on one of our questions in the chat too. So you mentioned export controls and trainings and uh, one anonymous questions ask, questioner asks, can tech firms help combat transnational repression? Um, what in the tech sector is happening at the moment to raise awareness or sort of combat the issue? Is this something that's even on their radar in terms of the private sector? <laughs> 
That's a really good question. Um, so certainly there are things we can push for in terms of responsibility, in terms of who technology companies sell their um, sell their uh, products to. So that's on one side on the sales. I think there's also an interesting question in terms of the role of social media here, right? Because we've talked a lot about digital threats um, and people who are harassed on Twitter often. This is state driven. I think even just in the case study countries that we cover in the report, Rwanda and Saudi Arabia, for example, are both known to have government directed um, online campaigns that are, are driven by hundreds or thousands of accounts. And within that there, you know, there's also other kind of permutations of it where there's mass reporting of accounts that can, that can lead to activists having their accounts removed. So you kind of have this whole host of very relevant issues to social media companies like hate speech, violence and threats online, and also these kind of manipulative reporting tactics. And so they are issues that are certainly tech companies are aware of, social media companies are aware of, but there's an important issue of raising awareness of what those actually mean because um, without the, the context, right, it's not necessarily clear what is happening when you see this. Um, so that's something that, you know, for us in this report, again, the issue of raising awareness is really important because um, without knowing necessarily that the Rwandan government directs Twitter trolls to report accounts and have people be removed from the platform, uh, the, the company might not understand the gravity of what they're seeing. Thanks for that. Uh, next, I wanna to move uh, to a question to the original convener of that forum at, at the Hammer Institute, which you're kind enough to mention, uh, who's Ed Lemon. Um, and Ed, thanks for, for tuning in and congratulations, look what you've done here. Um, so. Uh, Ed is actually asking about um, the TRAP Act and the prospects of the Biden administration engaging more on this issue, especially now given its new laws and focus on counter kleptocratic manipulation of the US legal and financial system. Um, do you think there's some some synergy here to also get into yeah. the anti-kleptocracy piece of this? Right. Yeah, I'll talk about in two. So I'll start with the trap and then widen out. Trap, um, Transnational Repression and Accountability uh, Prevent Accountability and Prevention Act. Um, it was introduced in the last Congress. Uh, it's essentially a bill focused primarily on Interpol abuse in the United States. So on making sure that US law enforcement and immigration authorities don't take uh, red notices and other Interpol notices as equivalent to arrest warrants, um, making sure that the U.S. works for good governance, better governance inside of Interpol itself, basically using its its voice and weight as a diplomatic presence in that organization. Very good bill. Um, we're definitely supportive. We include it in the much more detailed recommendations that we have in the full report. Um, I think in the new Congress, we'll see where it goes. You know, in the in the actual doing of it. Um, there's, it's always hard, and especially now without getting into congressional <laughs> difficulties around passing real legislation these days. Um, the bigger question about kleptocracy, about combating authoritarian influence, I think is really, is really good and is really positive. I think the bigger picture is that this administration comes in with a very strong mandate, um, they seem to think, a mandate to address um, authoritarian influence and authoritarian spread. Um, and Obviously, there's a lot of different ways that can go. There's a lot of different policy directions that can take, but some of the ones that have already been taken um, in the previous Congress and some of the ways this is starting out, I think are cause for hope. You know, that um, this administration takes it seriously. They take seriously the idea that democracy is something you really have to stand up for and that there are, um, there are actors who don't want it to succeed. Um, there are actors who don't want it to succeed outside of the United States and there's actors who don't want to succeed inside the United States. And that's a really important shift. Um, and so I do think we're going to see new developments in this direction. We're going to try to work on them. We hope others are too. Um, there's a much bigger, I think, constituency in Congress and in this administration than there has been in the past for really taking on some of the problems around um, all the mechanism of authoritarian influence, including, like you said, Ed, um, this base level around financial influence, um, which does undergird a lot of this stuff. And if I could follow that up, Nate, um, with a question from Carol Adelman. So, you know, that's the U.S. government part of it, an agenda. And she asked, uh, what are the institutions, NGOs, multilateral, interested and active in exposing and defeating transnational repression? Um, are there any useful partnerships with them? Have you found 
any particular international organizations and other NGOs, you know, receptive to this work and, and, and interested in, in promoting yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to highlight people who've done great work already. In addition to the academic voices that we mentioned, there's also um, Fair Trials um, has done terrific work on Interpol abuse for a decade. Um, they've been leaders in this. Ted Bromond at the Hudson Institute also convenes a regular Interpol working group um, with a lot of uh, lawyers um, working on this issue. Um, he's been great. Um, uh, in the digital sphere, Citizen Lab, um, which does amazing documentation, uh, forensic documentation frequently of spyware campaigns. Um, you know, and then you've got all of our regular folks, you know, out there, <laughs> Human Rights Watch, Amnesty. Um, I think there's a lot of awareness of the problem. I think, you know, what, and, and then there's, and there are a lot of steps that are being urged in order to combat it. I think getting us to kind of a single agenda is more of a tactical discussion right, of like, do we need a single agenda or can we have an overlapping, you know, pluralist agenda? I tend towards more towards the second, like thousand flowers kind of angle, um, rather than us trying to all get on the exact same box. But I think ultimately there's a big, there's a big space in the middle where everyone agrees. And that's, I think, the place where we want to work. And I think there's a lot of people already working there. And so I definitely want to note that we're not inventing this uh, as a field. Um, we're not the ones like creating this field. There's been so many people working on so many parts of this for a long time. Um, Isabel, we have a, a particular question here about um, exports um, from China of advanced surveillance systems to interested nations. Um, is this part of the issue in some of this? Is implicated in some of these arrangements? What can be done to counter this? Um, how many nations are putting in place Chinese systems and would the information in these systems sort of flow back uh, to China? This is an interesting question and I'll probably loop Nate in here as well on, on some of the China questions. Um, I was actually just talking a little bit about this with colleagues earlier today about how there are several sub-Saharan African countries using um, Huawei technology and working with the company to surveil and target exiles. And in that case, we were talking domestically, uh, but it's still kind of very much gets at this question of how this infrastructure is, is shared and spread. And um, the infrastructural question is really complicated because you know, as, as the US government, we talk about our recommendations for export controls. We don't of course have control over what technology is necessarily being um, exported from China to Zambia. Uh, but we can take, I think um, other steps, including close monitoring of how that information is used and more research um, into what the technology is used for to understand if it actually is being used in problematic ways or not. Because that's the thing about infrastructure, right? Is sometimes it may be used in ways that violate human rights, but sometimes not. And so that's where our role um, as, as researchers and as advocates comes in to really make sure that we are tracking the responsible use um, of technology that is outside of our control and also helping to build resilience in case it is used in, in a problematic way in certain countries. That's great. Nate, you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I'll just add a plug for my colleague Adrian Shabaz's uh, work. So Adrian is our Director of Technology and Democracy, and he has actually been working on a long article. I'm not quite sure when it's coming out uh, on uh, these infrastructure questions and surveillance technology exports. Um, so more to come on that basically is what I would say. And th then the second part of that that I would say to, to tag on what Isabel is, um, right, to, and, and to connect it with a hot topic right now is the Summit for Democracies idea that's that's up out there and seems likely that the Biden administration is going through with. Um, you know, the, the premise behind that, right, is that you have a group of countries that agree on certain values, agree on kind of lowest common denominators. A lot of questions around how low that denominator is, right, <laughs> um, and how high it should be. But certainly we would argue that one of the places that should be is that we don't export surveillance software to really openly repress the regimes. Because a lot of the surveillance stuff is coming from Western and Israeli firms. Um, you know, it's being built and sold, and it's being built and sold to, to regimes about which there are no questions. Uh, about their intention in terms of repression. Um, you know, there, there isn't a lot of doubt about what the UAE or Saudi Arabia might do with it in terms of their approach to domestic opposition, um, no matter where they're located. And 
that should be the kind of thing that, you know, a summit for democracies, whether in practice or in concept, you know, <clears throat> should be able to, to start talking about that we don't do this, you know, when that's what it means to be in this, in this club, right? Um, and hopefully you try to get more people to join the club, um, not fewer. It's a great suggestion also would make this rather than this kind of throwback to the 1990s, more of a forward looking kind of kind of agenda. Yeah, right? I mean, I think, you know, the summit is a complicated topic, but I think one of the ways to think about it that's productive is like, what are the concrete things that it would mean to be a democracy, you know, that we would expect? And, and not just in terms of, certainly in terms of your domestic standards, but also in terms of how you interact, right, um, with the world. So a couple of big picture questions I want to uh, pose to both of you. So uh, you're both experienced in doing this kind of sensitive work. Um, there's a question about in writing publicizing the report have you ever been attacked or targeted by the states engaging in the intimidation that you outline um, more broadly uh, what have been some of the, the the really difficult issues that you've encountered if you don't want to give exact details that fine but 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 take us through some of the um, you know in an ideal world what could you have done more of that maybe you weren't able to do now um, and what do you think we should do more of in the future if we can and there's another question in there about how could academics be involved in the research agenda going forward. So, you know, any of that on sort of, you know, the difficulties you've encountered and ideally where we should go from here, um, we would appreciate the um, thoughts on that. Who wants to take, Isabel, um, you want to take a first Yeah, go ahead, Isabel. Or? Yeah, you yeah. go first. So, yeah, there are certainly difficulties in doing this research. And I guess, well, I'll start, I'll start with, with kind of one area and it's that, it's really difficult to talk to people about these things. You know, we were doing, we had a kind of a variety of research methods that we used in this report and um, interviews was one of them. Um, and for particularly, for certain communities more than others, that was incredibly challenging um, because of the serious, serious trauma, I think that is so widespread in communities that deal with transnational oppression on a daily basis. And so finding people who are comfortable and willing to speak about it, especially kind of from the everyday perspective of, you know, they're not necessarily a very famous activist who, whose name you might see in the paper, but they are just a regular person trying to live their life and have to deal with this every single day and fear for their family back home. Um, I mean, that's a challenge as a researcher, but more so it's, it's difficult to find people who are open to speaking about that because of the nature of this issue. Um, and so that's where I think like really this kind of, the more sustained research on this, the better because building that kind of trust and building those kinds of connections is the way we will be able to learn more and do better research and, and take more appropriate steps to respond to the problems. Um, I'll also add that the pandemic was certainly a challenge in our research, particularly on the interview side, right? I mean, it's in, in a, we, we were hoping to go and talk to people in many different countries, and that was obviously uh, disrupted in the spring. Um, so that was a kind of a specific time snippet, but it also is um, gets back to this importance of really speaking to as many people as possible to understand um, to understand this topic. So Nate, I'll, I'll turn it over to you there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so much more to do on this. Um, there's, there's so many new ways to go that we think are important. Um, and let me, I guess I'll just say, you know, we are going to be keeping working on transnational oppression ourselves. So one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next year and change is we're going to kind of flip to focusing more on host states um, and what they can do to protect people. So we do have recommendations. We've, we think we've thought about it quite a bit, but there's a lot more to do about that. Um, and so we want to dig into that more deeply over the next year. And we're going to be kind of turning from origin states to host states in terms of our focus um, at Freedom House, at, at least on some level. Um, but in addition, I would say that doesn't mean the origin state work is done, if that makes sense. Like there's still more to do here. There's certainly stuff that we try, you know, we're especially when you take a global look, you wind up in a position where you're like, well, there's a lot of stuff you've got to leave out or a lot of stuff that isn't meeting a certain standard because you're trying to keep it to a manageable kind of threshold, right? But there's much more that can be done on specific communities that are being targeted, um, specific countries, campaigns, I think to elucidate those things. And we certainly hope people keep doing that. Um, and the second I would add, which is a big one, which we talked about, argued and or talked about a lot is, um, you know, we really focused on pretty targeted incidents 
So where it was either an individual or mostly small groups, occasionally a very large group, but where it was really clear that it was that whole group being targeted kind of all at once, if that makes sense. So like 100 people or 80 people or something, there's a couple incidents like that. But there are these questions, big questions, especially in areas with large displaced refugee populations across a border. And you have armed groups, armed groups perhaps forming around those refugee camps, but you also have military coming from that origin state into those refugee camps or into those displaced person settings and targeting people indiscriminately. That's transnational repression in some sense. It's not what we're dealing with. We don't want to say don't deal with that. We just needed to focus on something. We were focusing on something else. But there's so much there. There's so much there in that in that issue. Um, there's so much in the issues around, like I mentioned, third country bottlenecks. So places like Thailand and Turkey, where people get bottled up awaiting resettlement. Um, and there's just a lot more to do for sure. Um, I think this is, we're, we're doing the bird's eye and we certainly hope lots more people do, you know, up close. And um, interesting region specific question, maybe for Isabel here on um, if there is an accountability by the African Union, the United Nations, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, for instance, then how are these recommendations feasible? Uh, do you see some sort of agenda setting strategy for these regional organizations to get them on their agenda? I think it. I think it needs to be led at a really country specific basis, even within those kinds of organizations uh, and, and to get the buy-in that's needed, right? Um, because certainly uh, the incentives are not there. We found in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's six countries that fit our criteria of uh, engaging in transnational repression um, and another few that don't quite fall into our, our, um, our criteria and um, still more that are at very best complicit, I would say, in transnational repression. So finding the impetus to really tackle this is a challenge. We've seen some uh, glimmers of hope over the year, years, I think, uh, from, sub, from South Africa. So there have been a number of high profile attacks in South Africa over the years, assassination attempts. I think the most uh, well known is the um, assassination of Patrick Karagaya in, in January, 2014. Um, and the South African government has pursued the, uh, the suspects in that case over years um, and have also recalled diplomats from Rwanda, have uh, expelled diplomats that were Rwandan diplomats in South Africa in other cases. And I think that really is exactly what we're hoping to see more of. Um, and the problem is if it's only one country who is engaging in those types of activities in a serious sustained way, um, it's not going to make a difference. So I think it, and that, and that also makes it harder for a country like South Africa to continue taking those kinds of steps. So even outside of the region, if other countries step up and start taking this seriously and, um, and holding governments accountable, I think that makes it easier within the region for other governments who are maybe inclined to do so, to do it more and that can help build the momentum. Thanks for that. Uh, Nate, I wanna to switch to you and a couple of questions, one general, one um, more targeted about journalists. Um, one is uh, from uh, Joanne Lasowski. Uh, do you find that journalists were most often targeted? What can US journalists do to uh, help or protect? And then a specific one about Turkey from Henri Barki, who's on, uh, can harassment by government sponsored newspapers organizations be combated? Um, one example, the Turkish think tank, which has offices in DC, um, the target of foreign think tanks and newspapers and journalists. So uh, maybe some general thoughts on what you found about journalists and their targeting and then what do you think about what is going on in Turkey and some of their uh, um, uh, uh, offensives sure. and tactics in this area? Sure. I don't have our database open right in front of me to tell you how many journalists we had, but we definitely had, <laughs> Isabel, it's a finger in the air. Um, they're not the majority uh, of, of people, um, for sure. I can tell you that. Um, there are quite a few um, and a large number of people who are engaged in journalism, which we defined um, in a broader way in line with a lot of how human rights organizations now deal with this involving like publication of materials. Um, so includes certain kinds of social media publishing as well. Um, certainly we do have quite a bit of it. Um, and in terms of what can be done for them, I mean, there's, there's, there, there are good initiatives, I think, to, um, 
broadcast cases of violations. There's there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes among NGOs, of which Freedom House is only one, um, to address when journalists are facing attacks, whether nationally or, or transnationally. The trick is always speed. Um, I think in a lot of these cases, the the really the really harsh stuff happens very fast, right? And a matter of hours, um, if not days, I guess. Um, and so it's about how responsive can you be, and how quickly. Thanks, Isabel. Isabel messaged me sixty four journalists in the the six hundred and eight. Um, so there's certainly things that can be done. We think that you know, it, and I think the the areas to work on that are in supporting the big NGOs that work on this. Big. It makes them sound like they're large, but well, because they're not well known, you know, uh, Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, Committee to Protect Journalists, Reporters Sans Frontiers, um, organizations like this that are working in um, FIDE, IF, uh, IFCJ, working in collaboration is often the best way to address these things, is, is working in coalitions and collaboration. And they do exist, those coalitions and collaborations. Um, sorry, the second question. Yes, Henri's question. Um, I think that is a case, the SETA case, um, the, this, this smear campaign, right? SETA doing a smear campaign against all sorts of people um, while having an office in DC is a case where it's about how do we reputationally address this? Because not everything should be criminalized. Not everything can be criminalized or can be addressed through a legal mechanism. And honestly, if SETA wants to publish a report that is pretty nasty in its intent, and we all know it's nasty in its intent, um, but isn't criminal, I don't think it should be criminalized or should be punished administratively, um, you know, by revoking their registration or something in the US. Obviously, they violate the laws, fine. But, um, but it is reputational, right? So set a you know, and organizations, and this gets into this foreign influence, authoritarian influence question. SETA is a type of think tank that represents a government that's extremely autocratic at this point, and it holds events in DC and it invites people. And some of the people who attend don't know about, you know, what its kind of reputation is and what it's rep uh, what it's representing. And I think isolating that and making it clear that, you know, this isn't really a conversation. And, and that they are not uh, participating in the same conversation. I think that's the more appropriate way. It's more a social cost rather than, a, um, than some kind of financial or criminal cost. And actually just uh, Nate and, and Isabel, if you're interested in this too, a question from Arona Grady Vaughn here at the Harriman Institute. Interesting. Have you noticed any trends or differences in the uh, terms of, or I think the, terms of transnational repression employed by different types of authoritarian states. So for example, is there a difference between the, the monarchist states that use different uh, methods than say military dictatorships? Interesting question. Uh, I think it's a great question. We didn't try to answer it, um, but it's definitely a great secondary question for someone to do, Grady, you or someone else, um, you know, to take our data set and, and run it and or, or build your own, you know, with and, and run it and ask the question, because I think it's a great question. Um, certainly, I would say anecdotally, we see a lot of, you know, very personalized regimes engaged in the most extreme things. And I know that's not as distinct as the categorization that you gave, but personalized regimes where it's really come down to a single president normally, um, but sometimes a king or a crown prince who kind of take it very personally and who address these issues very personally. You see that in the Turkish case, you see that in the Saudi case, you see it in um, the, the case, the Chechen case, which is sort of a subset of the Russian case with Ramzan Kadyrov. Um, and that personalization of it is definitely an interesting aspect of all of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll and, add yeah. Um, on, I think the closest we got to really digging into that was on the Saudi case, um, because that there are a lot of cases uh, that are very personalized within that. Um, the Sa Saudi transnational repression really came into being as Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman rose to power in the last several years. So there's a very kind of personalized connection there. And also it's the same if you look at a lot of the targets of Saudi transnational repression because uh, quite a number of them are former insiders and not necessarily just members of the government, but actually members of the royal family who potentially could be some kind of threat from the inside in a different way than we might see in uh, countries that are not monarchies. So I think it is, a, it is a really interesting question to dig a bit more into.
Terrific. Well, it is one o'clock uh, and I think we have covered a lot of questions and a lot of conceptual territory. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, wind things down now uh, just because um, um, we have uh, people who wanna jump off and, and, and we're at the end of our lunch break in a perfect way here. I wanna thank uh, both of you for joining us today. I wanna to congratulate you again on the report. Um, but maybe just in closing, um, if you could just offer a couple of words of advice to people who are interested in this and interested in getting involved, um, you know, if you steer us to some of the work that you're doing and you mentioned some of those or other organizations, um, could you mention them again? Just by way of closing, people who have been sort of inspired and intrigued and interested in this, um, what are some suggestions about like some practical measures as soon as we log off Zoom that um, they can um, get into this topic more and, and, and try and make a difference. Um, let's we'll start with you, Nate, and then we'll go to Isabel. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, sure. I'm happy to, to list some, some folks working on these things um, already for a long time before us. Uh, I mentioned Fair Trials. Um, they have done terrific work, including legal work on Interpol abuse. Um, so their website has a lot of very clear reports and examples of the, the support they've given and the way that they've worked. Um, Citizen Lab, which I mentioned on the spyware and surveillance tech side, um, also does really excellent work in that area. Um, Let's see, uh, I'm trying to remember who else I, I talked about, but um, I guess in terms of things one, things one can do and ways one can be involved, I mean, I think that, um, it, how to put it, you know, someone asked about what are there ways that we can protect ourselves or what are ways that we can kind of um, be prepared in this area, you know, digital hygiene is number one. Um, and sorry to be boring, but, you know, audit your devices, audit your, your, your practices. Um, there's a lot of really good toolkits online, including I think Citizen Lab has one, but other organizations as well. Um, you'll find good digital hygiene toolkits that are applicable whether you're an activist or not, um, honestly, at this point. Um, if, even if you're just a regular person who doesn't engage in human rights work, um, it's always important to have good digital hygiene right now. Um, and so I would urge that would be my number one priority for everyone is to get, get your house in order uh, as much as you can and, uh, and be prepared for anything there. Same I'll to you the as well. same dead horse a little bit on digital hygiene and say, extend it to all of your contacts as well. Um, so people who aren't on this call, but who are you talking to in your work? Uh, who are you talking, who, who have you interviewed in your research? Um, and bring it up with them. And I think, you know, sharing this issue and um, talking about digital hygiene with more people is obviously good. But for those who are interested in doing more work on this, I think that once you start to talk about it with people uh, and kind of lift that rock, um, the worms will start to come out very, very quickly. Um, so I, I would say that's another kind of another step forward from here. Terrific. Well, thank you both. Uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to welcome you both back here for another webinar. Good luck with the rollout, the subsequent research, everything that you do on this important topic. Uh, I also want to thank the audience for joining us on your lunch hour. Uh, break, or maybe it was your dinner hour, or maybe breakfast. Um, we're always happy to have you. Stay tuned for uh, many more events uh, coming in the semester. Um, thanks a lot, everyone. Take care, stay safe. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much.